Hey folks, I'm Dr. Clark Foos at the University of Michigan Dearborn in the Department of Behavioral Sciences, and I'm one of the instructors that teaches Psych 260 Introduction to Brain and Behavior. So I wanted to give you just a little preview of what we cover in this class because it's really fascinating stuff. Um, I guess first, maybe as a segue, let me ask you, are, are you a nice person? Look at these people, are they nice people? Uh, actually, the, the, there's a trick there. None of these are actually people. These are AI generated faces, so they're not actually real individuals walking around out there, but do they look nice? What makes someone nice? If you were to brainstorm the sorts of characteristics, the things that cause or contribute to someone being nice, what might you write down? Things like being attentive, perhaps, polite, generous, optimistic, caring, humble, honest. How about genetics? How about your brain. Well, we know the brain obviously contributes to personality. We've known that for a long time. You may have heard of Phineas Gage, right? The railroad worker who had an iron rod go right through his face and out through the top of his head, destroying a large part of his left temporal or left frontal and temporal lobes, right? Did all that damage changed his personality. He was no longer the same individual after that damage that he was before. So something about the change to the brain caused this change in personality. That's the sort of thing we'd like to talk about in brain and behavior, right? This class. Now, we, we don't always have to wait around, thankfully, for somebody like Phineas Gage to get an iron rod shoved through their head. We use wonderful tools to be able to study behavior, both brain activity as well as the behavior of humans and animals, to be able to say something about how that brain and behavior interaction works. And we do so by having you know, some basic knowledge of stats and experimental design, right? Nothing heavy duty, this is a 200 level class, but the ability to look at a graph like this and see how these bars progress over time. The no food reward group really not progressing any faster towards getting to the end of that maze. The food reward group showing a rapid progression over time and then this group that didn't get rewarded until day 11 showing that they had latently learned the map the entire time right something we talk about in this class latent learning a uh, concept brought forward originally by this guy here uh, on the left edward tolman we also no, not only talk about the behavior of animals, right? Something we might talk about in sort of the context of cognition, but we also talk about their nervous system. And, and thankfully we have a much more evolved view than the Egyptian and Greek views of the nervous system. The Egyptians, in fact, in embalming, they'd take out your stomach, your intestines, your lungs, the liver, everything they felt was important, but you know what they left in there? something they didn't find quite so important. The Greeks, in fact, thought it worked as a sort of radiator. They, of course, wouldn't have used the analogy because they didn't have a radiator back then, but they said that the brain was served to cool the blood. Now, we know that's not the case. We know instead we have the central and peripheral nervous system that really contribute to all of our behaviors. They sense information from the environment. They allow us to control our muscles so that we can interact with the environment. They contribute to thoughts and memories that allow us to be who we are. And in this class, as well as in the classes you'll take that follow, we really use a combination of both this behavioral research where we look at animals and what they did, how frequently human beings press this key versus this key, or what types of words they remember, as well as active brain research where we might look at things like what area of the brain becomes active during a particular behavior. Now one thing we also ask, ask uh, I guess broadly is where do these neural signals come from? Where do they begin? It's kind of a chicken and an egg problem, right? You have to have the neural signal, but you have to have some stimulus to create the neural signal. That's a process we call sensory transduction, where say if I were to hold my thumb above a lighter, besides you probably saying, no, don't do that, I would also feel that pain, right? That would activate these nociceptors, these pain terminals that are in the skin, which would send the signals through these neurons up into my spinal cord, then up into my brain where I'd go, yow, that hurts, right? And so that's one thing that we talk about here. We, we then talk about the actual neurons themselves. I mean, neurons are a lot like me. My parents once got me a shirt when I was little that said he started talking and he can't shut up. Well, that's a neuron, right? It's firing and firing and firing. They're the cells that communicate in the body. So they send that signal of pain. My brain can send a signal through the neurons right back down to my hand to say, get it out of that flame, right? And those are the sorts of things that we're gonna talk about in this class. Now, neurons are cool on their own, but they're even cooler when they get into larger circuits and then systems and then networks and then whole hemispheres. That's where we can really start to talk about the distinct functions among these various circuits, right? The area of our brain called the primary motor cortex that deals with a lot of our physical motion of most of the muscles in our body. Or maybe the primary visual area, right? If you were to put your hand right behind your head on your occipital lobe, right back there, that deals with a lot of vision. Incidentally, if you ever get hit on the back of your head and you see stars, it's probably because you were just hitting the occipital lobe. 
We also know that the brain has this interesting wiring. It's almost like somebody was blind when they connected the things. All of the muscles on the left side of your body are controlled by the right side of your brain. The same thing with the opposite side. And in fact, this happens with sensation as well. So if I were to touch something with my right hand, that touch sensation would be felt in my left brain. Vision, as I'm staring right at the center of my camera right now, everything that's to the left of my vision, to the left of that camera, is being processed by the right side of my brain. This sort of cross-lateralization is present in a lot of the sensation and motor movement that we have throughout the cortex. We also have this sort of what might be called a topographic layout. So looking at the somatosensory and motor cortices, the areas that deal with touch sensation or physical movement respectively, we see this sort of layout of which part of the body is being controlled or being um, sensed, I suppose, in the, in the case of, of sensory input. Um, in that region of the brain. So you can see that one section there towards the middle that corresponds to either in the right hand figure, motor control over the muscles in your face and your lips and your eyebrows and things like that, or in the left hand figure, somatosensory receptors allowing you to feel touch sensation and things like that all over those same parts of the, the face. Okay, um, we also have this really cool thing in the brain called plasticity. Okay, plasticity comes in a couple of forms. There's the kind we all experience, a structural plasticity, where as we enrich our environment and we expose ourselves to more challenging materials, our brain will grow and develop and construct a more rigorous, complicated network of neurons to support that greater knowledge. We also have functional plasticity. If you have damage to a region of the brain, another part of the brain can come right along and potentially take over those those, those damaged functions allowing you to essentially, let's say, not miss a beat, though it, you might miss a beat at first, right? Another thing that we talk about in this class is thinking and consciousness. There was a really cool female researcher um, named Leslie Ungeleiter who came up with this uh, sort of distinction between the dorsal and ventral pathways. The idea that, you know, the dorsal fin of a dolphin is on its back. So that's the dorsal pathway. It goes up into this parietal section of the brain and seems to deal with our knowledge of where things are in our environment. But then we've got another pathway for things that we view, right? This is, these are visual pathways I'm talking about now, that goes down into the temporal area. And this area seems to be more associated with what the objects are. So if I were to be able to name this glass of delicious cranberry mango juice as a glass of delicious cranberry mango juice, it, I'm doing that because my visual recognition system is working to be able to assign words to the things that I'm looking at. Individuals who have damage to that what pathway experience what's called blind sight, where they're no longer consciously aware of the things in that visual pathway. So if it's only on one side of their environment, they might not see anything on the right side, be consciously, or excuse me, unconscious, unaware of anything there. So it's sort of a connection between how perception and processing of the world around us is related to consciousness. Another thing we talk about in this class is memory, of course. Memory dictates pretty much everything you are. It's probably the single most important concept in the history of the world. Sorry, I'm a memory researcher, so I'm a little bit biased here. But we talk about it from the standpoint of information processing. Things come in from the environment, might be lights, might be sounds, might be me studying for a test. That information has to get processed first for its sensory properties, then eventually get it a short-term memory where I can think about it and rehearse it and maybe study, some of it's gonna get forgotten, and then hopefully transfer a bunch of it into long-term memory, and then later on in the test, retrieve it back out of long-term memory and write it down, right? We also look at memory from the standpoint of individuals who've had damage to their memory. So a famous amnesia, Henry Molasson, formerly known as HM while he was still being studied, but he's passed now, um, he told us a lot because the damage to his hippocampus and medial temporal lobes resulted in him being an amnesiac where he could no longer create these new long-term memories. And so we learned a lot about how the hippocampus was related to memory storage through instances like Henry Molasson, right? More cool stuff we get to talk about in this class. As long as we're talking about memories, language, one of the most unique things that humans have to bear to say that we have something different from every other species on the planet, we can talk to one another. Well, how do we do it? Well, it looks like a whole network of different areas are involved. We have a system in what's called Broca's area that's involved entirely in production, connects to your motor cortex to allow you to actually form the words and speak. When it's damaged, we have difficulty talking, we have difficulty getting the words out, but we can still understand things just fine. By contrast, if you damage Wernicke's area, a section a little further back, we damage comprehension, but we can still produce words no problem, right? So these two areas of the brain are sort of dissociated from one another in their functions and control over language abilities. Then, as long as we're talking about control, we have to be able to control the things I'm thinking about. I have to sometimes be able to block out a really common automatic task that I normally do in order to do something else. And in order for me to manage that, 
I have to really have what's called executive function and some control over memory. So I, when I cross the road here in the United States, every time I walk up to the sidewalk, I look left, I look right, I'm always told to do both, but looking left is a little more important because those are the cars that are going to hit me first. But that's because in the United States and in many other parts of the world, we drive on the right-hand side. In England, they drive on the left-hand side of the road, and they thankfully recognize that Americans and some other tourists are likely to get hit by cars because they're not looking in the right direction. <laughs> the right direction. And so they've written things like this directly on the road at some of those popular tourist areas to make sure that we look the correct way instead of our automatic behavior, right? Stroop came up with a task like this, you may have already heard about, where he asked people to rename the colors of words. Now, if I do that like this list here, and the words themselves are all neutral things like window and boat and chair and dog, it's really quite easy. If I do it with words that they themselves are color words, maybe it gets a little harder. Probably not if the word red is written in red, but once I give you the incompatible list where the word red is written in yellow and you're to name the colors, we find that that contrast, that conflict between an automatic and a controlled process creates a slowing, right? Longer reaction times, we have to actually stop and think about this. And it's one way that we measure executive function and control of memory. Another really cool thing that we get to study in this class is emotion. Right? I love the way emotion plays into behavior. It's one of my areas of research as well. I'm fascinated by memory and emotion. And we've got a lot of different theories that have been developed over the years to really describe how emotion works. One, my favorite, though largely disproven, is the James Lang theory that says that we first feel the physiological reaction from a stimulus, and then we assign an emotion to it. So if this individual was asked to hold a chopstick in her teeth, as opposed to in her lips, in her teeth, she looks like she's smiling. Researchers found that if people rated cartoons while holding chopsticks in their teeth as opposed to in their lips, they found them funnier, right? Physiological bodily response interpreted then as happiness. Now, there are of course some issues with this. Your body has the same response physiologically, increased heart rate, sweating, pulse, things like that, to being threatened and going for a nice jog. So how do you decide which emotional feeling you're going to put on there? Well, that's why we need more theories of emotion. Appraisal theories, in fact, is where we would go in this class. And I guess, you know, as long as we're talking about it, everything evolves. Emotions evolve, memory evolves, our brains were never designed to remember everything, right? Only the tiny, most important stuff. And over time, we devoted more and more tissue, more anatomy, more real estate to being able to handle those important things in memory. And it's probably the case that our brains will always continue that sort of evolutionary track of whichever things are likely to lead to our survival. Those are the things that are going to be emphasized in our brain. So we can look at other organisms and see how that's occurred over time. So that's, you know, a little bit of a long rundown for you. A good 12 minutes, 13 minutes of a preview to that class. But I hope you like it. If you want to know more, contact me. Uh, contact somebody else in the department that might be teaching the class at some time. But let, let us know. We're really fascinated to hear from you. We can't wait to see you in class. All right. Cheers.